Uh, <laughs> why Chappelle? What interested you in this story? Well, I guess two answers. One is that I am a, I've been a huge Chappelle fan for many, many, many years. I love the Chappelle show. I love his stand-up. I've always – and weirdly, you wouldn't think it. But we have an oddly similar background <laughs> oh. that, that uh, I know we don't look much alike, but Dave Chappelle and I both grew up in the same uh, Maryland suburb. Oh, really? In, in, around in elementary school. And then we both moved to Washington, D.C. for high school. And then we both, uh, and then he moved to New York and played comedy clubs, which is what I cover now. Oh. Um, and so about two, so I was always interested in him, and um, the uh, and I think there was I think it was about you know I, I, I guess the, the other story is about two years ago I took over um, this new beat as the, the comedy critic of the New York Times, and um, so I was seeing comedians all the time, and you know the the, the sort of new the new kind of post podcast post internet era comedians are more accessible than ever. Right. Um, right. And Chappelle always the, struck me as besides the fact that he's brilliant, he's just an incredibly fascinating story because in an era when comedians are all you know, you, you know, are so accessible and you can easily find them, here's a guy who is incredibly remote. And even though he's still performing, it's really hard to see a show. And you know, at the, there's this mystery at, the, at the, the center of Chappelle, which is why did he leave Comedy Central and why did he – kind of transform himself from this, um, you know, high profile comedian into kind of an underground comedian. And that, so that, that was just from a pure news point of view, I thought this is like the greatest mystery in comedy. Uh, and so since my job is to cover comedy in the time, I was like, well, this is like, you know, the, what, what better story is there to pursue? Cause even, even, even if you don't like Chappelle, right. Even if you don't think he's that significant, which I think he's incredibly significant, um, and you know it's a fascinating story. Uh, and uh, I guess the last point I'll say is this: is that you know, for a guy who has left um, the public eye in 2005, um, he remains incredibly influential, um, and that's something that I saw just covering the comedy scene. You know, if you you know writing a story on the, on Amy Schumer show, you see his influence. Going to comedy clubs, you see his influence. You see comedians still citing him. You see sketch people still citing him. Um, the guy has, is in some ways bigger than ever. So I felt like, you know, here's this big white whale of a story. I want to attack it. Yeah. Right. And, and the thing with, with him is, is that he, I, the part that I like the most in, in the book um, is that you talk about how Chris Rock and Kevin Hart they'll see Chappelle just show up at a club and unannounced and he'll get up there and he'll do all this crowd work and everything. And they look at each other like, why can't we be that funny? I mean, I don't, that is so remarkable because look, comedians are very competitive like everybody else. Uh, you know, Richard Pryor and Bill Cosby, you know, they wanted to be the best, right? They want to be the best. So to have, like your peers, and that's what Chris Rock. Chris Rock's a few years older. Kevin Hart was coming up at the same clubs, Boston Comedy Club, at Chappelle. To have your peers say that, um, you know, really says a lot about the respect this guy has. Oh, without a doubt, and I, I really love, and I've heard the quote before, but I love when you talk about how Eddie Murphy went to Pryor about what Cosby had to say about his act, and he said, "Tell Bill to have a smile and a coke and shut the fuck up." <laughs> and, yeah, no, it's. Well, I mean, there, there's sort of, a, especially I think like in black comedy, there's like, for many years, there was only, I think it's changed now, but for many years, there was only sort of room in pop culture for a variety of reasons for a few prominent black, famous black comedians. And uh, so, you know, Cosby, Pryor, Red Fox, you know, they, there, there was fewer opportunities for black comics than white comics to, to be in the mainstream. So, um I think you started to see that change a little bit in the last decade or two. And, uh, but because of that, uh, if you're looking at what are the influences of a Dave Chappelle or a Kevin Hart um, or, or a comedian today, you know, it's pretty easy to trace. If you, were look, if you were growing up in the 70s, 
what comedians you were looking at. Oh, and, and like when, when you mentioned Red Fox, I remember a bit he did about how there's no there's a standing order at the door, no fucking midgets allowed. And <laughs> it's like I don't know why that's so funny, but it had me dying. <laughs> you know, and I I think that uh, I mean some of the I, I'd put Chappelle, I I because I I do stand up, I okay. make horror movies. I'm, I I try I'm trying my hand at everything. You know, something's got to stick against the wall, right? Good for you, yeah. <laughs> and when I think of comedians, I mean, there's the obviously there's the Holy Trinity. There's Carlin, Pryor, and Hicks. Everybody thinks you know that's, the, but Chappelle is just kind of on this completely different plane when it comes to doing stand up. That I don't think any one of them could. I don't want to say reach, but they kind of approach things a little bit differently than he does. And what do you think it is with him that puts him apart from so many others? Huh. Well, I mean, I think there's a that's a there's a lot of different answers to that. I think that um, uh, it depends which aspect of his work you're talking about. I think you know his sketch show was really trailblazing in a lot of ways. Oh, without um, a doubt, yeah. And I think that you know at that time the idea of building a sketch show around one person. You know, like one aesthetic. Um, you know, it had been done prior, done one, but that that was you know that, that was pretty unusual. Um, and uh, so, so it, and his sketch show did things very differently. They decided their sketches were much longer. It addressed race in a way that I think hadn't been addressed. Um, but I think you know the thing is, um, I, I and I think uh, I think Chappelle was a prodigy. You know, he was a brilliant guy who started very young at 14, and um, he got good real fast. He was good as, uh, you know, a te but by the time he was like 18 or 19, people were saying this guy's going to be great, he was going to be heralded. And I think because he was so good so fast, he was able to take a lot of bigger risks and do things, which think a little more outside the box than a lot of other comedians do. So, I mean, I think the, the Chappelle Show is a perfect example um, but I think, uh, I think also like, you know, if you look at his stand up, he's very hard to categorize, you know, he's, he's, uh, uh, you know, like that's, he came up at a time when there was a lot of like observational humor, which Chappelle really didn't do, wasn't, wasn't necessarily even pigeonhole, but also there was a lot of really aggressive, loud humor. Chappelle right. was very like laid back, patient storytelling style that I think sets him apart in a lot of ways. And I also think there's something about him. He's a real good listener. He's comfortable being on stage and not talking. You know, like he has this one thing where he says he'll begin a joke. He'll say, um, you know, I probably shouldn't tell you this. And then, and then he stops. And in that moment, he's created all this suspense, right? And he's like, all right, I'll, you know, I, I think, uh, I think it was, um, one, uh, I talked to the director of Half Baked, who made, made this comparison, uh, where he said that uh, you know Chris Rock would say you know gets in your face and is like, "Listen to me," right? Right. Pell makes you, you know, sort of pauses, takes his time, creates the suspense, and makes you listen closer. Um, and uh, you know, I think that's a real that's that's a real gift. And I think I think also. He's got a way of, this is something else I really like about Chappelle. Most comedians have a kind of attitude which is like, here's the subject I'm going to address, and I know the answer, right? Here's my point of view. And it's a strong point of view. Most good comedians are like, here's a stronger. Chappelle does something where he's sort of, instead of just saying, here's my point of view, he sort of t raises a question, kind of marvels at it, puzzles at it, like looks at it at several different angles. And then gives you sort of like an, a, a surprising take on it. And I think there's something really appealing about that. I think, I think it makes him a lot more relatable. Because he doesn't seem like just some arrogant guy who knows everything. Uh, and uh, because of that, I think he can get away with saying a lot more provocative things. Um, uh, anyway, so that's a less a long, long-winded <laughs> answer. But, but I think I, I'll give, I'll, let me try to give a shorter answer. He's, he's a rare comedian who can do stand-up, can act, can write, uh, can do sketch work, is an absolute master at improv. Um, he can do, not, there's a lot of comedians can do all of those exceptionally well. 
Um, even some of the people you mentioned as the Holy Trinity, you know, Carlin was not. He's the, not an AI. Yeah, he was not an improv guy at all. Not an improv guy. It's not like you'd say, oh, the Carlin sketch work or, you know, Carlin was not autobiographical at all. You know, he, he had, could act though. He could act, so he had that. He could act, um, but I mean, I think I would I would argue that Chappelle's range. Chappelle could do laid back, you know, sort of. Uh, character work, and he could also do real and like subtle nuance, and he could also do big and broad, like Rick James. Right. Uh, and that's you know, there's not many comedians, especially these days, where you have like all these all comedians who are kind of quirky and can do sort of more like uh, cerebral work, and then you have big commercial guys. Chappelle could do both. Well, I think if there's anybody out there today who's on even on a similar level to Chappelle, I would have to go with Louis. Yeah, although I think they're very different. Oh, they're, yeah, their styles are di very different. But, I mean, like, you know, Louis has his own show. He writes, he directs, he stars, you know, and he still does his stand-up. And, and that's and in that aspect, I think there's nobody uh, that can touch either one of them. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think Louis is a – I mean, but even – but, you know, like, for it's a, it's a sign of – this is partially about the, the, how the comedy scene has changed. Louis right now is probably the biggest comedian in America. Right. Right? But – you know, the biggest comedian in America in 2013 is nowhere near as big as the biggest comedian in America 20 years ago, 10 years ago. You know, Jerry, if you look at the number, the, the ratings for Louie, yeah. they're, they're like a tiny fraction of what Seinfeld had. You know, if you look at, I mean, the, the culture is fragmented so much that, um, you know, the, the level of fame, I mean, Louie has a tiny budget and he has a, you know, Louis isn't getting a uh, $100 million contract. <laughs> no. So, but that, that, that has no knock on Louis. That just has to do with how the culture has changed. Right, exactly. Now, from Dave Chappelle and stand up, let's move over just a little bit because we were having this conversation before we started recording and it, 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 the shirt and everything. Uh, what got you into horror? Because to write a book like that, like Shock Valley, you have to be into horror. Oh, I'm I'm uh, I'm a horror nut. I'm a horror nut. I, I uh, you know I'm a kind of, I'm a believer that uh, the things that you love when you're a little kid stick with you your whole life. Right. Like those are the things that you love most. You know that. And right. horror. I was into horror before I was into anything. I mean, I loved horror as a kid. I loved Friday the Thirteenth movies. I remember as like a you know in fourth grade hearing somebody's older brother tell. tell you know, I remember. You, you know, back then, before internet and DVDs, the way you found out about Friday the 13th was through people's older brother. And oh, yeah. he they would tell a story about what would happen. I remember, like, going over the plots of those movies. But anyways, so uh, I've always loved horror, and I, and I, I read a book called uh, Easy Rider Raging Bull by Peter Biskin, which is a book, a reported book about the revolution in Hollywood movies in the 70s and how – movies like uh, The Godfather by you know, Coppola and Scorsese and Bogdanovich and all those great movies got made and it was sort of a behind the scenes look at what happened and it was a great book but it, when I read it I thought I, you know th this is a great book but it's, it doesn't include all of my favorite movies from that period by Brian De Palma and by Wes Craven and by Polanski and so I said I would love to write a like a, a horror version of this book and it hadn't been written and um, my idea was that like in this period between 1968 and 1980, all or not, or most of the tropes of that of the modern horror movie were established that are still incredibly not just still they're more powerful and popular than ever. Uh, and whether it's you know the zomb you know George, George Romero zombies or you know things established in the slasher movie or all these, things. so I wanted to kind of trace where these uh, you know these great horror you know, now cliches came from by exploring how these great movies were made. And what I discovered, which is one of a theme that I'm really interested in, is how, you know, we, we kind of have this romantic idea that like the best art comes from like uncompromising work that like screw the suits, fuck, right, you know, right. it's got to be the pure artistic vision. And the reality is if you look closely at how alien and, you know, Carrie and all these movies were made, Night of the Living Dead, is, for one thing, they're much more collaborative than you think, and two, and The Exorcist, they're often the product of artistic compromise and 
commercial impulses. You know, in a lot of ways, the story of great horror art is how commercial instincts can create great art. And that's what I, I, and that's what I think is the story. You know, that's p partially why horror back then was so disreputable. But I think that's changed now. Um, but um, anyways. So well, that's, 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 my, <laughs> I have a big have problem with problem today's horror. Today's horror. You're not the only one. Um, uh, what's your problem? What's your particular issue with it? Well, okay, I'm not a big... I've said this before, and I guess I'm going on record as saying it now. I'm not a fan of Eli Roth. Okay. Okay, I think that the Hostel movies are kind of like, hey, let's just see what we can get away with. Right, right, right. You know? uh, and now, I, I understand that we're not going to be able to go back, and we're not going to be able to get another Dawn of the Dead, because the, and, and for Dawn of the Dead 1978 is by far my favorite film. It's in great. horror or outside of horror. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I mean, I think Rome, what Romero did with that is like better than like Taxi Driver. So that's just, but yeah. that's just me. No, 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 I agree. What, 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 what do you think of the remake? Um, <laughs> it, it would have been great if it had been called something else. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I mean, it was, it, I went to go see it in the theater and I was one of those assholes who sat there with his arms crossed like this saying, you know, this isn't going to be as good. And I went in with a horribly preconceived notion that this was going to suck. Uh -huh. And then the part in the remake when she's driving down the road and you see the WGO end copter go by uh -huh. and she's listening to the radio and she said, you know, because it's supposedly based in Wisconsin. I wish James Gunn would have come to Wisconsin first. Um, <laughs> but as she's driving and she says, and in Racine, we have no further news for you, and that's where I live. Oh, wow. And, and it's like, oh, we're up on the big screen, but I didn't think of, oh, wow, great for Racine. I hear, and in Racine, we have no further news for you. I yell out in the crowded theater, oh, great, we're fucked. <laughs> and, and, and that was where the, you know, the movie kind of went for me. But, um, I, I mean, if it would have been called, wouldn't have been called Dawn of the Dead, I would have enjoyed it. But right. you know, um, and like the Ch Texas Chainsaw Massacre remakes, uh, no interest whatsoever. Uh, it, it's funny in the in the new one, the Texas Chainsaw 3D. I don't uh -huh. know if you've, have you seen that yet. The latest, I did not see. I, I just assumed it would be terrible. I it's well, that's the thing is everybody thinks it's a remake, but it's a sequel to the first one. Huh? What a dumb idea. Well, actually, it's not too bad if you but really, really, really suspend disbelief. Okay. But, it, but in the behind the scenes, um, Gunnar Hansen makes fun of the guy who played Leatherface in the remake. Oh, really? Yeah, because he's there standing. They like they recreated the house for the uh, for the this new one, and they have the metal door that he slams. And he wow. goes, Andrew, uh, the Andrew from the remake, he kind of shuts the door like this. But the real, <laughs> but the real Leatherface shuts it like this, and he slams the fucking door. And I'm just like, yeah, that was great. Can't be, can't be that scene. I mean, no, uh, that is such a good scene. I mean, actually, I just, I just blurbed Gunnar Hansen. Gunnar Hansen just wrote a uh, a book, a me memoir about a Texas Chainsaw Massacre, nice. which is quite good. He's like, he's a very, he's a good writer and a very gentle guy. For as big <laughs> um, as he is, yeah, yeah, he's a, and uh, and he got screwed. I mean, he never, he didn't get any, wasn't any of the sequels and didn't get any of the money or whatever. But he's a, uh, but that that actually might be my. Is, is I think the the greatest of all horror movies. Is Chainsaw? My, yeah. Chains, Chainsaw to me is the one that I can I never get bored of, um, and I can just watch it. And and you know it was the had the most unpretentious and fascinating origins. Uh, I mean it just um, it's the most unlikely masterpiece, uh, but it is. I mean and it's it's not just the fucking scariest movie if you've never seen it before. Uh, you've ever seen, but it's also just a gorgeous movie. It's a beautifully shot and edited movie, um, and it you know on a shoestring. Oh well, the thing with the thing with Chainsaw is, is that's what actually got me into horror. I was seven years old. My parents are divorced. My dad had been working during the day, and he picked me up for the afternoon, and it was a Saturday. And this is back when VHS tapes were still popular. Okay, mm -hmm. hey kids, VHS. Mm -hmm. um, and it, there was a tape sticking out. It didn't have a label on it, and it was sticking on the VCR. He's sitting in his recliner, passed out. And I'm, I'm like, well, I'm gonna. I don't like watching golf on TV, so I'm. I pushed the tape in. If the tape had been porn, we'd be having a completely different conversation right now. But I pop it in, and it's Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and he's about a fourth of the way through the film. Uh, and so the first thing I see, and I have to say it like they would say it in the film. The first thing I see is Bubba putting that bitch on a hook. 
<laughs> oh, that's so good. That's the first thing I see. And then now when I know what's going on, you know, having made a few, you know, like I think I made like 10 or 12 shorts. I know how things work. I still can't figure out how they did that fucking hook scene. And then, you know what I mean? You, even, even after they show it, and they, you know how you do it. It's like, that. there's no way. But the genius of that, of that scene is that everyone who sees that scene thinks it was this incredibly gory, brutally violent scene. You don't see any penetration. No you blood. Don't see, you don't see no... What you see, it's, a, it's actually like Toby Hooper at his most Hitchcockian because what you see is, you know, you see her getting put in the hook and then he pans... But you don't see the hook going through her skin. Then it pans down to the bucket. You don't see blood drop in the bucket. You just see the bucket... And then you, you're, he, you have to connect in your mind, what's that bucket for? Oh, shit. I know what that bucket's for. And in doing that, that makes it so much scarier than if you, know, if you just you saw the, the, the body go through. And it, so, I mean, Texas Chainsaw, is, one thing that's fascinating about it is if you actually look at it, it's not that gory. It's not that gory. Everyone says it's a bloodbath, but you know what? I think that the way he shot it, and it having the name Texas Chainsaw Massacre, automatically people are going to think it's going to be this, this you know, gigantic Tom Savini romp. It's it's not. It, it, it does have incredible um, art direction by uh, what's his name, Robert Burns, I think, who yeah. went to do uh, Hills Have Eyes. I mean, so the the you know all those bones and the, and the sound design is just unbelievably great. Uh, and I can tell you, you know, you're not the only person. You know, you said you got into or because of that, I would say, you know, I, I you know, interviewed every single horror, great horror director you can name from the 70s and including many, you know, from the 80s, 90s and today. And I would say by far the, the you know, I would say, why, how did you get started in horror? Uh, what movie inspired you? By far, Texas Chainsaw was the one that people cite. Um, and everyone's got a story like yours. It's like remembering when Kennedy was shot. It was like I, and you know, because back then it was not easy to see these movies. You had to like, and especially in the 70s, you had to really fucking search them out. But you know, Dan O'Bannon, before they shot an Alien, the scene where the Alien busts out the chestburster scene, he made Ridley Scott watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, Kubrick, before he made The Shining, he said, you know, he. he said the, the movie that, you know, he watched Texas Chainsaw Massacre, that was the one that he wanted to get the, or, you know, uh, go down the list. Like, that's the, that is the movie that really, I think, inspired, Spielberg, talk, Spielberg is, you know, raves about Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, and I think was a huge influence on him. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just a incredible work. It looks like a B movie. And, it, and, look, and it look what it's done. You know, but uh, you, you, you talk about how, how hard it was to see things back then. Now, I don't know how old you are, and I'm not going to, to imply that I know your age, but do you remember when trying to watch Evil Dead, the original Evil Dead, you had to find a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy because it was nowhere? Yes, yes. And now there's 14 versions of it on Blu-ray at Best Buy. Which, is, which you know, I hate to be like an old fogey, and I'm in my late 30s. Uh, but uh, the, uh, it's, I think it actually is a shame because there, there's something about that experience like of going into a, a video store and as a kid and looking at those covers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the fucking covers are better than half the movies there, right? Looking at the horror. I used to go in and I used to look at the cover for, you know, April Fool's Day. Oh, She's got the noose, you know, the, her hair in the noose. Yeah. And, uh, and I would imagine in my head you know what the fuck is this thing about where is this what's this dinner party what and you know it was that was like a great and then when i saw it you know i didn't have a million coming attractions in my head and all the expectations you know you actually were genuinely surprised by what you saw and that's i think not to again not to sound like an old fogey but kids today <laughs> hey i'm right there with you kids today they don't they don't have that experience because it, you know, unless they, it takes a lot of effort to go into a movie knowing very little, knowing nothing about it. Right. Well, there was a movie I remember. Uh, there was a Hollywood, uh, Holly, no, Planet Video, by my house, 
And I went in there and I looked at the guy and I says, where's your horror section? He's like, oh, you want to see a great horror movie? I was like, yeah. And he handed me the box of this film called Alien Prey. I don't know if you're familiar with this film. Oh. It was shot in a, uh, in, in a month, maybe a month or a weekend. I forget, but it was really bad. It's about an alien coming down, taking the form of this guy after he kills him. And, uh, and then he gets uh, taken in by a couple of lesbians and he sees them having sex. So you know this had to be made in the 70s. Uh, and so he just assumes that he can do it. And then he ends up eating one of the chicks. And there's a sequence when they're in the water of this lake. And they're like splashing around and whatever. Like it's, I forget what it, what, why they were in the water. That's how bad it was. But apparently the lake was so contaminated. And they needed to get the shot so bad that they just told everybody go in the water. And then when they got out they all had to get shots. And it was like, oh, my God. That's just, uh, really? You're going to do that? And then, and that's when I got introduced to Evil Dead 2. Because I came back with that movie, and I said, what is this piece of shit? And then he's like, well, here, try this. And then that's when I first saw the cover for Dead by Dawn. And what, I was, did you like, which do you like better, Evil Dead or Evil Dead 2? Well, bef- let me preface it with say, by saying this. I hate the fact that everybody, with the, when it comes to the remake, is like, well, it wasn't funny. The original Evil Dead was funny. No, it wasn't funny. You're the right. The sequel was funny. The sequel was funny, right. You know, and I I liked the first one for what they tried to do. And I thought it was the grossest thing I saw in a while. Without being too over the top. Um, but I'm going to have to go with Evil Dead too, Just because, yeah. it, you know, I mean, how often can you have a, a, a deer head on the wall laughing at you? <laughs> yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you. Evil Dead 2 is a special movie. I mean, it, I, it really is. If I if I ever did a, a sequel to, to Shock Value about the '80s, um, it would be about because I think I mean I'm generally believe that like the '70s is the real golden age of horror, um, and that that the greatest horror movies were made in the '70s. Um, but uh, the the '80s I think was the golden age of horror comedy. Um, that like uh, you know you got Evil Dead two you got uh, O'Bannon's Return of the Living Dead yeah Gremlins uh, you know the kind of big budget horror uh, Landis uh, I guess this is this is not my was is it is it early eighties or not American Werewolf in London yeah it was is like eighty two or eighty three or maybe eighty one I'm not sure which is a spectacular movie oh yeah the, uh, I mean I think that like to have a movie that is genuinely scary and genuinely funny in a big mainstream way that's really hard in fact it's like the only you know these days every horror subgenre has been remade and redone and oh, vampires yeah. on but, but the one thing i think that they a little bit with uh shauna the dead and some of that stuff but like they haven't really been able to recapture the big like essentially gremlins like gremlins for some reason hollywood can't figure out how to how to do the 2013 version of Gremlins. Well, there's there's Tucker and Dale versus Evil, which was pretty good. I don't know if you saw that one. I don't think I did see that one, actually. It's, no. it's actually really good. You should check it out. Okay. Uh, but uh, they they were able to kind of mesh the whole comedy and horror thing together. Uh-huh. And um, it kind of took the whole, like, rednecks in the woods, teens come in kind of thing. When was it made? Uh, just a year or two ago. Who Who made it? Ah, uh, now you're gonna make me look it up. I have the trusty iPad sitting right here. Um, I know Alan Tudyk's in it from Firefly, oh. but uh, Tucker and Dale vs. Evil first thing that pops up right underneath Tucker Max, one of our <laughs> one of our great literary geniuses, uh, Eli Craig. Eli Craig, all right, I'll it check it out. out. Yeah, it came out from uh, Magnet. Put it out. It came out in 2010. Okay. So, but um, no, that's just, and I think that. I agree with you. I mean, Gremlins was pretty much the the height of the, you know, and and I think they tried to be funny with the later Freddy movies, but they failed horribly. Um, and no, what's, you're right. I, and I think that it's <laughs> the thing that cracks me up the most about Nightmare on Elm Street is, in retrospect, everybody's like, "Oh yeah, we knew we were making a gay movie with Nightmare 2. Like, yeah, we knew it was all we knew it was gay. And Robert England was like, "No, I knew right away. I knew right away. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Sure, you did." <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the 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 those those movies and uh, and Craven in general, you can argue, you know, ushered in a certain kind of comedy s- style to horror. But it's a little like winking and knowing and clever. Although right. 
Freddy is sort of like a Borschfeld comic. I actually wrote a story for Vanity Fair Online just analyzing the comedy of Freddy, like the, like the one-liners. Because like, he actually he has all of them. You know, he's like a, that was the, the new thing about Freddy, is like the serial killer as a Borschfeld comic. But, he, uh, but, he, um, but I think movies like American Werewolf and Gremlins, they're like, it's, it's a bigger, it's like a you know, broader comedy. It's, like, right. it's, it, it's not like hyper-ironic and you know, obviously Scream is a kind of comedy has some comedic elements to it, but it's sort of a, a snarkier version. Right. My favorite Freddy one-liner, by the way, is in part three. Uh, here it is, Jennifer. Your big break in TV. Welcome to prime time, bitch. And then he just... <laughs> and, and then, the, you know, and here's the thing that bothers me about that, is the doctor and, and poor Larry Fishburne, you know, playing the orderly, where's the stool underneath her her feet when she's hanging out of the TV. And how did she jump with that much force to put her head? Oh no, there's nothing strange going on. Their dreams aren't doing anything to them. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And, and how'd they get Larry Fishburne in that movie, huh? Because he had nothing else better going on, I, I guess. guess. Right. He, yes. hadn't, he hadn't become Morpheus yet. There's a good, there's a good subject of like fancy movie stars who starred in like sequels to horror show, like, Matthew McConaughey, oh. his Elwiger and Texas Chainsaw, whatever it was. Uh, <laughs> oh man, that was so bad. That was so. Was so Roseanne in one of the uh, Friday the Thirteenth and the uh, one of the late ones, I think. Yeah, and you know what? The, you know one of the one of the greatest experiences ever is is when you're you you watch Weekend at Bernie's, and then you go maybe a month, and then you watch Friday the Thirteenth Part Seven, and you realize. <laughs> Bernie's Dr. Cruz, <laughs> and it takes you half the movie to put it together. You don't know, I don't know why, but it's like you're watching, like, wait a minute, why does that guy look so fucking familiar? <laughs> oh, there you go, all right. But, um, do you who, who I, mean, I know this kind of drifted off from, from comedy, but I think comedy and horror are kind of similar because they're I both. Do, I agree. Uh, who today would you say is, um, the best at their game when it comes to horror? I'm gonna have to go with Ty West. I, I'm, I I like Ty West a lot. I like Ty West a lot, and I'm I'm a big fan of the whole glass eye picks. Um, you know, I mean that I'm a little bit biased. I'm based out of New York, and so all those guys, uh, including like JT Petty and Graham Resnick and Ty West, who's had the most success. I I, I, I and Fessenden, I, I'm a huge fan of. Um, but I think for a big budget stuff um i think the uh del toro yeah is is definitely like in terms of like making monsters i don't think there's anybody oh, no. on his on his plane um and uh and he also but he doesn't he's not just have a great he doesn't just have a great design sense but you know he knows his lovecraft and he knows his horror and he um, so I think for, he's sort of the great hope for a big one, you know, and then, then, so yeah, then these indie guys, you know, like I also like Ty West a lot. Um, who else do Did I Did you see like? The Conjuring? I just saw The Conjuring just like a couple days ago. Uh, I was going to, I was going to say James Wan, I'm sort of like, I'm torn about. Um, I think he's, his, his directing style has changed a lot. He's grown up quite a bit from the, the first Saw film. It's true. Although I, you know, I like the first saw. I gotta say, I like. I'm, I'm not. I know what you mean by Eli. Eli Roth. Well, Hostel, saw is different from Hostel, though. It is different than Hostel. You're right. I think Saw is much better than Hostel. Um, or you know, although I, I, there's, there's things I like about Hostel too. I have to say, but the uh, um, the Conjuring, which people loved, got incredible great reviews. I, I and I think is really really good. I, I, I guess I went in like with really high expectations. I think it's visually incredible. I think it's scary. I think it's got like some, you know, I think in a lot of ways he he shoots what I like about him is he's got like an old fashioned aesthetic in which like when you first go into that house, he does like a one shot. He does, he does a shot of the whole place, gives you a sense of the whole landscape, he like sets you. It's not like a million quick cuts, right? That's like a, in, in this day and age, that's old school to like show you patiently establish the, the setting and then uh, not rely on just the cheap quick cuts to, to scare you. I like that. I like the, the, uh, you know, the look of it, but I, what, what I, what I was disappointed in a little bit is I felt like my favorite horror films have like a, um, either have like a, a deeper character, um, like have like another 
like complex, interesting character study, or they have another thematic level. Like you know, Dawn of the Dead obviously is also about consumerism, or right. um, The Exorcist. You know, which is obviously any like uh, one of these you know, exorcism movies can be compared to, is you know has this the, the Catholicism of The Exorcist makes it more terrifying, and yeah. I felt I, I felt like. I didn't know what he was thinking. Like, I felt like by having it, it wasn't, it didn't play on religious themes, which is always a risk if you're done with an exorcist movie. You didn't really explore them. And it mainly seemed interested in the relationship between the two exorcists, you know, the, the couple. And there was that one scene that kept happening where she was like, she was, you know, he was like, I'm going to go do it. And she's like, I'm going to come with you. Don't, don't come with me. Right. I'm gonna so I felt like he was interested in the idea of like their relationship, but it never got deep enough that I really cared about them that much. So anyway, that's all just minor coming out. As, like a, as a horror film, it was so much more competent and scary and elegantly shot than most shit out there. But I, I didn't find it great. Well, my thing uh, is, like you mentioned, the, the whole getting the whole landscape thing. The last time I've seen that in a major motion, a major horror film would be The Shining with yeah. Danny on the, on the big wheel. You know? And I love that, that he used him as a vehicle to showcase the entire hotel. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention was is only horror fans seem to pick up on this, and even some horror fans don't pick up on it, is the last line in The Conjuring, spoiler alert, when she says that the father wants to talk to them about another case in Long Island. Right. No one seems to get it. It's right, like, right, right, really? Right. Are you, what is wrong with you people? <laughs> They're going to go hang out with James Brolin and Margot Kidder. <laughs> hey, you could do worse. You could do, I wish I could go hang out with Margot Kidder. Yeah, and before yeah. or after she went crazy. Either, either. I mean, I prefer I prefer Black Christmas era uh, Mario Kidder. That mouth on her was crazy in that movie. It's fantastic. That's that's a great movie. That's a guy, Bob Clark. He's an underrated uh, uh, director. Oh, and, and I love how he did that. And he did uh, he did Children Shouldn't Play with Dead Things. And he then did, and then you ever he, see Dead of Night. What's that? You ever see Dead of Night, which is also called Death Dream? I have not. Go see it. It's one. It's it's. He made it right out right before uh, Black Christmas. One of the best horror films. Ever. It's it's basically a a zombie movie, a political zombie movie about a guy who comes back from Vietnam, and he's but he's he's dead, but he's a zombie. Right. Um, and uh, it's like the you know there was like it was like an anti war it was like an anti war movie before there was any mainstream anti war movies about Vietnam. But that aside, it's a great. Uh, it's a great character study. Like the like the really good. The, the main the father is the guy. You know you know the the Godfather the horse head scene and the Godfather. Yes. The guy who wakes up with the horse head is the main character in it. Oh wow! And this is like this is like a year or two before he did the Godfather. So it actually has really good actors. I mean Bob Clark all you know Black Christmas good actors. He also did a movie. He did a Sherlock Holmes movie with like this like John Gilgood or something. I forgot really? some some really good. He he's a He's always been, and then he did a Christmas story. Yeah, exactly. You get children's shirt and play with dead things, Black Christmas, and then a you know, Christmas story. Yeah, and, you know? and Black Christmas, you know, I'm sure, is like, you know, that Halloween took a lot of shit from that movie. I think Carpenter but, admits it, though. Well, you should read Shock Value. I go in, I, I ask him about it. Really? Uh, so was, yeah. was Carpenter nice to you? Because I, I know people who've had some really shitty experiences with John Carpenter. I, uh, he was very nice to me. My, my guess is he probably would have some issues with the book because a big subplot of the book is his relationship with Dan O'Bannon, who wrote Alien. Right. And they both went to USC film school together in the late 60s in the class right after George Lucas. And I think that if you look at most of the reviews of my book, I think the first thing people talk about is how the book is sort of an argument that O'Bannon is like the most un, is the unsung hero of the modern horror film, and that they they their first movie together was Dark Star, um, Dark O'Bannon Star. and Carpenter. And then uh, I I through the process of reporting the book, I discovered several student films that they made at USC O'Bannon and Carpenter, and I found um, movies that resembled Halloween even before Black Christmas. Um, and, uh, which I have, which I, I got, they were 16 millimeter. I converted it. Uh, they're like shorts. Um, but anyways, the point is, is that, uh, O'Bannon 
was a very who died recently uh, or a couple years ago, and I interview. I was one of the last people. I was the last person to give him like a long, long interview with him. Um, uh, I think is a real genius and was a huge influence. And Carpenter will admit this. He has admit this. It was a huge influence on Carpenter. Now Carpenter was also a huge influence on O'Bannon. They were best friends. They were really close. They were very good friends and artistic partners. And they had a real big falling out. So then they went on over the course of two years to make Halloween and Alien, which are arguably you know two of the greatest accomplishments in the genre. So uh, I liked Carpenter. I had a good. I had good inter- interviews with him. He was perfectly. Uh, he was perfectly nice, and I think he's a brilliant filmmaker. But I think he, uh, um, I, I think that his, I think O'Bannon hasn't gotten the credit for uh, that he that he has. Um, anyway, so so that that, that said, um, uh, Carpenter, I think is like a, you know, he's a he's a kind of a cranky guy who's a, a little old man. Yeah, exactly, and he's sort of like his career. I think as he sees it. You know, everyone wants to talk to him about Halloween, which is a movie he made in a few weeks in the beginning of his career, at the relative beginning of his career, you know. So he, uh, that, that, he gets a little upset about that. I, I would probably ask him when's the third Snake Plissken movie coming out. But, <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's, uh, but, oh, man, I, uh, I had a friend who went to Flashback Weekend um, in Chicago a couple of years ago when he was the guest of honor. Yeah. Total dick. And then, but then this year, the guest of honor was George Romero, nicest guy on the planet. And he figured George, who looks like he's knock, knock, knocking on death's door, you know, because he lives on cigarettes and coffee on set. You know, anybody, anybody who's worth their salt and horror knows that knows the, the George Romero diet on set. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, in there, there, you're right. I mean, Romero's a real cuddly, yeah. sweet guy who's also like what six foot ten something. <laughs> He's a, he's a big, yeah, he's a he's a super big guy, and he's, uh, but you know, I, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time with him as well. But the uh, see, if, but, you, if, you, if there's something in there about Romero, then now I have to get the book. See, everybody has to buy the book because that while Texas Chainsaw Massacre got me into horror, Dawn of the Dead made me want to make movies. Well, there's a lot in about Romero. There's and there's a, there's some in about De- Dawn of the Dead, definitely. But I focus much more on Night of the Living Dead, not right. because I one better than the other, but just because Night of the Living Dead is more significant. Uh, but I do I do definitely talk about uh, Dawn of the Dead, and in particular, I focus on um, the uh, relationship between Romero and Argento in making Dawn of the Dead, um, because he had a he had a pretty a key role. Um, because Romero was sick, you know. Romero, the thing about Romero is he didn't want to make any more zombie movies, right? Uh, and you know, uh, and it required in part Argento's help because he sort of really championed Night of the Living Dead in Italy, and he flew him over to uh, to Italy and gave him like a room and he, you know, the, the music and the whole thing. So the uh, so um, that that was that's a, and that's a really interesting story because up until that point, American horror was. You know, it was in one world, and Italian horror, which is obviously incredibly influential, also it was in another world. But then you started to see this sort of cross pollination, right? And uh, now, of course, horror is so global, and you know, you fucking yeah. everybody remaking these classic '70s American horror films for European or whatever Asian. So, but back then, it wasn't like that. Back then, it was like American horror. It's like a, it's like American jazz or something. It was like it was a in indi- they were other. There clearly were other horror movies made elsewhere, but the the it was the, the most fertile ground was here, Amen. and it was and it was here not in Hollywood you know it was in everywhere from fucking New York to Pittsburgh to you know to Toronto to to fucking Texas I mean Texas Chainsaw is a huge part of my book um, so um, See, but yeah Romero you, you, you you'll you'll be interested in I mean Romero is a that, that's how t- Night of the Living Dead happens is just an incredible story I mean it's just like totally but. Uh, well, get your stamp out and just slam sold across my forehead because uh, <laughs> that's, that's got me. Uh, so if you're a comedy fan, pick up Searching for Dave Chappelle. And if you're a horror fan, pick up Shock Value. Wow. And it's if, like two things in one. What's better? I, nothing could be better. But uh, I, I, one, one last thing I love uh, about Romero is that he got his start on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Which he says was the scariest movie he ever made. Was it? <laughs> It was called, I'm, I'm forgetting it, but it was something like 
Mr. Rogers gets a tonsillectomy or something. There's some like there's some. It's oh not, yeah, I remember that. Yes. Yeah. But, yeah, uh, because if you grew up in Pittsburgh, there were only so many places you could get experience. You know, dreading that was one. Uh, Mr. Fred Rogers. Yeah. Who's the quite possibly the nicest person ever to live? A Amen. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, the, and I love how Chef Brockett was in Day of the Dead as a zombie. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that just that cracks me up in that whole area. Real quick, just want to get your opinion on his later films, Land, Look. Diary, and Survival. I haven't. You know, I'm a I'm the wrong person to ask for that because I don't have. I haven't really. I think I haven't seen the last one. Uh, diary. I uh, I liked okay. Uh, the, uh, yeah, my my. Uh, I liked. What was, what was the last? What was the one before that one? Land of the Dead, with Dennis Hopper. No. What, what was the one before? Maybe. What was the one before that? Day, when they're in the bunker. Yeah, as, as you can tell, I'm a little. They're all blurred into one. There, there was one I liked more than the others, um, but for the most part, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I'm not a not an expert on it. Well, that's fair enough. You have a lot, a lot going on, a lot going on in that brain of yours. <laughs> so, now, are you working on anything else uh, now that's uh, searching for Dave Chappelle's out? Or, well, now I'm kind of going back to my day job. Like you know, I sort of focused on this for a couple for a while, and now I, I. I write this column where every other week I, I write on stand-up or improv or uh, something having to do with comedy. Um, so, um, like, I'll, I'm starting to try to figure out what my stories are for, I'll probably do something on, on late night, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's sort of back, back to the, back to that, 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 uh, that, my, my day job, essentially. Now, um. That's in the New York Times and on the New York Times website too, or is it just definitely New York Times? The uh, I think actually they're going to give. It, I've been doing it for two years, but they're going to give it a name. I think it's going to be on comedy. But the uh, but uh, but yeah, essentially, if you could find or go to my, I would say my my Twitter is where you could always find. I'll uh, at Zinneman. Uh, I'll put put up the comedy column every two weeks, and uh, and that's uh, you know, I, that that's something I'm I'm proud of because it's there wasn't that didn't exist at the times before. Um, they didn't cover, from a critical point of view, regularly uh, comedy. Uh, so, so I think it's it's, it's exciting thing for to, to, and that's something I like doing. Well, there you go. Well, I thank you so much for being on. It's uh, a pleasure. They're great questions. You, 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 and I have like a, our Venn diagram of interest seems to overlap. And, and exactly, and that's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs>